We'll just give one more minute. I'd like to welcome you all to Talks, Carnegie Mellon Silicon Valley's Talks on Computing Systems. We'd like to bring once a week uh, an interesting speaker about some topic of either very broad systems interest or very particular new application. Um, the talk is being recorded and is also available to people on Adobe Connect. So we often have a number of people connected remotely. And over time, we have built up quite a library of interesting talks that you can peruse if you go to the website looking for talks, T-O-C-S. So with that, I'd like to welcome today's speaker, who I really appreciate him filling in for us at the last minute when the previous speaker became ill and wasn't able to uh, come. Uh, this is Dr. Robert Berch, who is um, a direct co-founder of Skytran. And he'll talk about the compelling alternative to the car. His background is he comes from uh, UC Santa Cruz, did his PhD there. Actually, I spent some time at UC Santa Cruz also, so that's kind of interesting. And we'll talk about interesting ways of changing the economics and the technology that support urban transportation. So with that, I'll hand over to Dr. Berch. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I actually got my PhD in computer science, but it was it's called bioinformatics, uh, applying computer science to biology. So I did a lot of computational biology and um, ended up at NASA because I um, got interested in uh, doing genomics on algae to make biofuels. I became very concerned about energy and uh, thought I could apply my genome experience to, to grow algae in the ocean to make biofuels. And after working here at NASA for two years, realized that there's a lot of non-technical barriers to biofuels. So we ended up doing a transportation seminar at NASA, inviting a lot of innovative companies to talk about how can we solve the transportation problems going forward. And one of the companies that spoke was Skytran. So I got so excited about the company and the computer science challenges that I left NASA and, and created a partnership where we're now hosted at their research park just across the the grass there. So if you, if you guys ever want to come over and see the vehicle, we've got one full-size prototype in Building 14 across the lawn. Um, so that's a little history of how I got here. Um, I'm going to, uh, this is actually a two-part talk. I'm going to, today I'm going to just go into an introduction of Skytran, talk a little bit about the software tools we've built so far, to show you the simulations tools, and then next time on June 5th, I'm going to go into the algorithms uh, and more computer science talk. Um, so I apologize if it's not technical enough today, but we'll, uh, we'll it's more than I can cover in an hour, so I decided to split up into two talks. Um, so this will be a good introduction to what we're actually trying to solve. So the, the real, one of the two uh, key questions is, is uh, global warming and pollution. But most people today, when they drive to work, don't think about, oh, I'm polluting the environment, I'm causing global warming. They think about, you know, I'm, st I'm being stuck in traffic on 101. So we're kind of coming at the problem of uh, global warming and energy efficiency and uh, oil independence from the angle of what do people care about most? And that's really congestion. This is a, a worldwide problem. Many cities around the world uh, have c severe congestion problems. In fact, there was a recent traffic jam in China that lasted for several days. Uh, China is, is producing cars at uh, an unbelievable rate, 25 million cars a year. They're going before, before the end of the decade, they'll have more cars than the U.S. And this is going to create a huge problem in terms of the global oil infrastructure and, and just the resource utilization of cars, not to mention the parking spaces and everything associated with driving cars. So we thought if we can come up with a technology that actually solves congestion, it will also solve these other problems of, of pollution and, and resource depletion. So what is Skytran? It's a, it's a low emission vehicle. It, it uses about 100 watt hours per mile, which is half of the uh, energy usage of an electric car. Uh, it, it can go very high speed. Uh, we eventually want to get this thing up to 150 miles an hour top speed. Uh, Obviously, we're not looking at those speeds right today, but that's the, the end goal, is to go very fast and compete with regional air traffic. 
it's silent, uh, secure, safe, uh, very low energy consumption. And the, the key part about this is it doesn't stop at traffic lights. Um, it only stops at your final destination. Um, and the other thing about it is it's low cost. Uh, if you're familiar with public transit systems, in the Bay Area, we just got $2 billion to extend BART for 10 miles. That comes out to $200 million per mile. So traditional rail <coughs> infrastructure is very expensive and, and has limited the usefulness in, in America, basically. So can we do a, a, a public transit system that doesn't require tax subsidies? This is an unheard of. If you ask any public transit official, can we do a transit system without tax subsidies? They'll, they'll tell you you're crazy. It's impossible. We subsidize on two levels. We subsidize capital costs by the federal government. But we also subsidize operations with local and state money. Um, and why do people not use public? Even though it's free, it's fairly low cost, it's cheaper than driving, people still don't use it because it's slow, it's inconvenient, it pollutes, it's vulnerable, it's, it requires a massive infrastructure, and, and it's very expensive. So what is Skytrain? Um, what do we do? Fundamentally, it's three things. We replace this gigantic concrete infrastructure um, with the way you see here with an elevated guideway. And the elevated guideway does a number of things. It gets traffic off the streets. You know, m many at dense urban areas, you just can't put, uh, if you want to put buses or train system in, you've got to take away lanes from existing traffic or take away parking. And people get very upset when you want to take away their parking spaces, especially business owners. So we need to think about the third dimension. Um, and and the, the traditional barrier to elevated transportation, it was very expensive. Uh, elevated BART is $200 million a mile. The New York subway system, they just ran a new line up 2nd Avenue in Manhattan. It costs $2 billion a mile to, to go underground. So this is a, a major barrier to, to doing uh, transportation. So if you can do a low-cost elevated guideway, that really solves a major problem. The other thing we're doing is we're replacing the combustion engine, which is typically about 30% efficiency. Uh, with a, a linear motor, which is 90% efficient or 85% efficient, something like that. Um, and we, the main innovation is we're replacing the wheels with, um, oops, just clicked it. Uh, the main innovation that we're doing uh, with, with um, is replacing the wheels with magnetic levitation. And magnetic levitation has a, oh, sorry, has had a bad reputation. Um, there have been a few experiments with maglev. Um, for example, Transrapid is a German company. They built a magne maglev train in Shanghai. Uh, it uses, the big problem with it, it uses active levitation, so that means you've got to put energy into the coils to create lift to levitate the vehicles. And the tolerance on the, the motor and the levitation system is something like a millimeter of clearance. So you're Imagine you're in a vehicle that's flying at 250 miles an hour, and the, the gap between the magnets and the coils is, is very small. Yes? So how understood it, they built it that way. So if the energy fails, it drops to the like, tires, so it can't like, run out. So how does it work with the SkyTran? What's the failure mechanism? If, like, how do you break if you don't have energy? Right. So um, the, the passive maglev works with forward motion. So if you lose energy, the vehicle still is moving forward and it still will levitate. Uh, once you pass below the transition speed, which is about 10 miles an hour or 5 miles an hour, depending on the inductance and the coils, then you go down onto wheels. So but let's say like, like you're traveling at 150 miles and you lose like power. So how do you stop? Well, you coast, right? You have two options. There's, you can either, there's several braking systems. You can use regenerative braking, which obviously won't work if the power's out. So we have resistors in the, in the vehicle that can dump the power, and you can slow down with using the resistors, electron, electrical brake. There's also a third braking system, which is an eddy brake. So if, you put, if you've ever passed a, a magnet past an aluminum plate, there's a huge drag there. And this is how roller coasters stop, use braking systems. So with an eddy brake, that's a mechanical backup system that you can break the vehicle at six Gs. Okay, thanks. Yep. And the, the, the other important point is the, the tolerance, right? If you have a, a levitation system like Transrapid with a 
very tight tolerance. It requires a lot of engineering to make this track very smooth and flat without any warps. And it, it turned out the cost of doing that transrapid track was huge because they had to make it so flat and so perfect. With the passive maglev, we can have a very big gap. So if we can tolerate in, you know, imperfections in the track and the guideway and still maintain uh, integrity. Yes? Yeah, uh, a while ago, it was like two years ago, we saw a presentation from the people who made the London airport transportation system. And it looked a lot like your system, except it was looked more like monorails, where the cars were on elevated concrete lines. And I was curious. How you felt they were as a competitor, or they got the right approach? How is, how is your approach different than their approach? Um, and they were really focused on the computer science algorithms of how do you do on time delivery of vehicles, and it, it seemed like the algorithms were ahead of the, uh, <laughs> of the track, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, they, their system is uh, basically an ele uh, electric golf cart, it's a battery operated vehicle on a concrete roadway. The maximum speed, I think. Was right now it's 25 miles an hour. They're trying to increase it to 30. Um, it will never go very fast because you're limited by this concrete roadway and the infrastructure. Um, it's really duplicating the highway system. Um, I don't think it offers a compelling alternative. Um, the guideways, each column is loading is about 10 tons. Of, it's quite a heavy infrastructure. Um, I think. The secret to replacing cars is providing a, a compelling alternative, and you have to go as fast as a car if you're going to compete with it. I don't think uh, if you're going on a maximum speed of 30 miles an hour, it doesn't, uh, it's not going to be a scalable solution, right? We want this to be scalable to not only just local circulators, but also regional uh, transportation systems. And um, you're not avoiding the mechanical issues of a, of a, of a car. Uh, we really want to minimize the number of moving parts in the system so that the maintenance cost is low and it's cheap to build and operate. And the, the maglev, what it does is it, if you think about a tire on a road, it's constantly hitting potholes or creating point loads into the infrastructure, which causes a lot of maintenance. With maglev, you spread the load over a very large contact area, so you don't get any high point loads on the infrastructure. So that allows us to make the guideway very light lightweight. Uh, the guideway is basically an extruded aluminum uh, form that, that's made you know, in very high volume, very cheap to manufacture. Um, the other, um, uh, the, the, um, the other difference with um, our vehicles is our vehicles are smaller. They're two passenger vehicles. Um, the, the system you're talking about is a four-passenger vehicle, and uh, that creates a lot of extra weight on the guideway. It increases the infrastructure costs, and we really feel the optimal vehicle size is two-passenger. Um, and I can talk more about the capacity. I'm going to talk about capacity in a second, but the, um, the extra, every time you, do if you double the weight of the vehicle, you're doubling the infrastructure cost. And, and that kills the whole business model. We really want to keep the capital cost below $9 million a mile to make it competitive uh, so that you can actually run it with a profit. Their system requires a tax subsidy. And, and we're really trying to make this completely financially sustainable, which means it has to you know, earn enough money to pay for itself. And, and the whole secret is lightweight. The minute you go with these big, heavy vehicles, this is why trains and buses have such a hard time, because their, their capital cost is immense to build the infrastructure. Even uh, bus rapid transit is very popular now. The problem with bus rapid transit is if you run it on asphalt roads, in a very short amount of time, if you have short headways, the buses will actually turn the streets into little divots where the road where the tires go. So the, it turns out you have to repave the road with a concrete um, foundation. And that costs, you know, twenty, thirty million dollars a mile to, to make p concrete roadways. So uh, we're really trying to change the equation and say let's do elevated infrastructure and not occupy real estate. Okay, a little bit about capacity. Um, the capacity of SkyTrain is fourteen thousand uh, people per hour, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll 
doesn't really mean anything to most people, so I'll give you some comparison. And the real other innovation is this offline guideway. If you, I'm sure everyone here is taking Caltrain at one point or another, and if, you, if you're lucky enough to take a local train from here to San Francisco, you know they stop at every single station, and it takes an hour to get to San Francisco. Imagine if you had a, an offline station at, at every, every way, so every train is an express train. You can get from here to San Francisco in 24 minutes if, if you had this type of architecture, because you're never stopping, uh, and you have a very high your average speed is equal to your top speed. Caltrain goes 80 miles an hour, but the average speed is 30 because it's stopping so often. So this is a real, I mean, the freeways have had this technology you know, since World War II, but we've never applied this to public transit. Um, and just to give you an analogy, the 14,000 per hour is equivalent to a three-lane uh, freeway. So if it, uh, each lane of traffic carries 2,500 cars per hour. The separation between vehicles is about two seconds. Yep. So a quick question on that. Um, we have to slow down from 150 miles and go up to 150 miles again. This takes quite some space. So how dense can you think you, or do you think you want to make those stations? Is it like Caltrain, like in every kind of major settlement, or like buses? Or how do you like? Yeah, that's a great that? question. I think what you would do is have <clears throat> local circulators where you're going 40 miles an hour within towns. So like uh, Mountain View would have a circulator that goes from Google to Castro Street and back up. And then you would have limited areas where you would accelerate from 40 to 150 miles an hour, miles an hour high speed section. So you wouldn't need stations. The stations for the low speed guideway will be every quarter mile. That's about a five minute walk. But at the high speed stations, you might have less frequent connections to the circulator. So you'd have a, instead of doing a linear line to San Francisco, you'd have a loop in Menlo Park, a loop in Stanford University, one in, you know, each town would have its own off uh, segment, so you'd, you'd be able to collect people from the whole area rather than just make them all go to the common uh, central station. Uh, it's more of a network rather than a line haul system. And the other nice thing about a network is you can have redundancy, right? You, you wouldn't have just one line running up the peninsula. You'd have one at 280, one at El Camino, and one at 101. So if any one guideway failed, you could route vehicles around it, just the way we route packets on the internet. Um, so really, this is a, a physical manifestation of, of the same protocols we would use on the internet. So getting back to my um, analogy of the, the capacity, um, because the vehicles are spaced at half-second spacing, uh, instead of 2,500 cars per hour on the freeway, we get uh, something like 7,000 cars per hour in each lane of, of SkyTran. And then if you put two people in the vehicle, you get to 14,000. Now, obviously, you can't run the system at 100% capacity. You've got to run at about 80% capacity to allow gaps for merging and demerging. So the true throughput is around 11,000 people per hour, which is on the level of a BART or Caltrain uh, peak capacity. In fact, I think Caltrain's peak capacity, if you put 1,000 people in Caltrain and you run five trains an hour, it actually only holds 5,000 people an hour. So this would be triple the capacity of Caltrain. Um, here's an, just a little video that was taken by the U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation. This was in 1994, showing vehicles at quarter second spacing. Uh, so the technology has been around for, for automated vehicles for a long time. And the real barriers, I think, are non-technical. How do you merge driverless vehicles with driver vehicles on the same freeway? And you can see here they've got a special lane dedicated for these traffics. And, and Google now is, is working on automated cars again. And I think they're doing a great job of bringing the technology up to modern standards. And, and, and what I see is a sort of merging of the driverless cars with SkyTrain, where you would take SkyTrain for dense urban areas, for long distance trips, and the driverless car meets you at the station and you home the last few miles. So I think there's a, a role for both of those technologies uh, in the future. And uh, the nice thing about SkyTrain is we don't have to worry about lane changing and and collisions and people walking in front of the car. 
one of the biggest problems with driverless cars is the bouncing ball problem, right? Every driver knows if you see a red ball bouncing in front of your car, there's probably a kid right behind it. And, and recognizing that situation is difficult for an automated car. And I think um, there's real benefits to, to getting transportation off the ground, um, you know, enabling biking and walking. Yes? So how, how high would you do this? Is it over sidewalks side or over the road? Or? Yeah, you would do it. Um, so basically, the federal highway limit is 16 feet. A truck cannot go above 16 feet. So the bottom of SkyTrain would start about a foot above that. So the guideways are about 20 feet in the air. You could do it over the road, or you could do it over uh, the sidewalk. You know, it's quite flexible. Um, in fact, I'll show you a picture here where it's, you could even put it over a building. Right? The, the, you can diagonally go across a block. There's no real uh, restriction once you have an elevated infrastructure. And by putting the street lights integrated with the poles, you can make it fit in with the urban context. Um, it has a minimal carbon footprint. It doesn't burn energy unless the vehicle is actually moving. Here's another picture of what it would look like in an urban setting. You can't quite see it here because of the contrast. But as you build out more infrastructure, you reduce the number of cars and, and parking spaces could be repurposed for urban gardens or walking and so forth. Um, one of the problems with public transit systems is they they attract crowds. And uh, the, one of the nice things about SkyTrain is it distributes the people away from each other so you don't have any targets. Uh, the vehicles are secure, so we know who people are in the vehicle. So Unlike uh, public transit, which tends to get trashed by people, uh, rental car companies have solved this problem by knowing who rents the car, so, so you maintain the cleanliness of the vehicles. Here's an interesting uh, possibility. You can actually have vehicles going directly into buildings uh, and have secure stations for, for companies or apartment buildings where you just, you just arrive in the lobby. It, this is a, a shot of... A, a street in San Francisco, you can see we've kind of become used to this overhead rat's nest of wires and cables. Um, one of the things, nice things you can do with SkyTrain is put the wires inside the guideway. We've allowed space for utilities inside. And if you integrate the street lights, um, you do two things. Clean up the street uh, and also allow the parking spaces to be reused for other purposes. So another uh, reason people don't use public transit, women especially, is they don't want to be in a crowded bus with a lot of other people. <laughs> and you can imagine the kind of things that happen. So, Or if you want to have a phone conversation in private, it's really nice to have your own vehicle. And this is why we drive cars, right? We want privacy. We don't want to be um, in with a lot of people moving around. So, so SkyTrain gives you that possibility. The vehicles are two passengers, as I said before, uh, tandem seating. Um, and, and the common question comes up, well, what do I do if I have a family of four? And it would be the same thing as if you're on an airliner where your seats aren't all next to each other. You have part of the family is in one vehicle, the rest of the family is in the other vehicle, and you have video links between them. Yes? I think the real question is, what do I do if I have a family of five? Because <laughs> you, you have four, one parent, one child, that works out, but when you have more than Well, if they're really kids. small kids, you could put two in a seat, or you have three vehicles. You know, it's... Um, I think the this is a or, or in that case you might take a car. You know uh, this is not a replacement for all cars, right? This is a uh, solving 90% of the car trips, which are single passenger uh, vehicles. Uh, we we can't possibly think of replacing all possible forms. Yeah. But mm -hmm. Then if every person needs a car for those occasions, you really can't repurpose the parking spaces because now you've got even more cars parked because you got a lot of people not using them, right? Most families have two to three cars. This would be a replacement for one of those cars. They would have one less car in their family, or maybe two less. Um, but in the U.S., we have one car per person in the whole population. So we have 300 million cars. If, if we got rid of a quarter of those and, and use SkyTran, the nice thing about SkyTran is you can reuse the vehicle 10 to 20 times in a day. Um, if you look at the simulations, I'll show you later, um, uh, you, you could probably have one of these vehicles for every 10 in the population um, because you can reuse it constantly. Most cars sit idle 
you know, 23 out of 24 hours a day. Um, and if you get people reusing the SkyTrain vehicles, then you don't need as many private vehicles. Yep. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, the, the problem is how do you transition, right? You need a transition period where you have both systems operating at the same time. Um, and it's, yeah, it's packets. Well, generally, you don't want to have five lanes all next to each other. The reason we have freeways is it's the right-of-way issues. But what I would do in a city is have a SkyTrain every mile, right? Distribute the, the, the guideways apart so you have stations that are a five-minute walk from, from everyone. You, you don't really need to have this concentrated flow of cars. It's, it's, I would rather have four or five parallel tracks all spread apart by a mile, and you, you create a network so you're not concentrating traffic into a single corridor. Right? Are you, are you asking would you ever want this on the ground? But I mean, I want to see. Sure, you just make cut the pole shorter, you know. Oh, uh, well, the the whole the, fundamentally moving vehicles on the ground are incompatible with walking and biking and pedestrians. So, uh, I I don't know why you'd want to put it on the ground if it works elevated, because then you you make more walkable communities. Um, Well, that's what automated cars are, right? That's driverless cars. I mean, that's that's a, a different fundamental technology. And I think we'll have that. We will have it. But I think there's certain situations where you'd want elevated infrastructure. Mm-hmm. On demand. I th I th I'm not sure I follow your. Yes. So how loud is that vehicle? Because if you think you want to have it elevated in inside a city, so I mean uh, I know of Chicago, it's pretty loud when you live next to one of those trains. So. How loud would it be if, if you had a line like running next to your window? So a, a typical train system is a steel wheel on steel rail. It's a very high. Uh, this is a electric motor, which doesn't make sound. The, the sound is the aerodynamic wind sound. This okay. would high speed sections would be where you currently have three or four lane roads, which are it would be much quieter than a three lane freeway. Well, let's assume you have like a residential area where ride like 40 miles an hour and have like, let's say, at rush hour, like how loud would it be if you have a constant flow of, of cars there? Would it be like really disturbing me and wake me up in the morning? No, it wouldn't. It would be very, very quiet. Much, for example, if you consider San Antonio Road or something like that, with, which is two lanes in each direction, this would be much quieter than that. Much, much quieter. Um, there's no contacting parts, right? There's no friction. There's no... Um, most of the road noise is rubber tires rolling on the asphalt. Um, and because the vehicle is very aerodynamic, it will have a minimal wind sound. But there will be some sound, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a boot here. It's not shown, but there's a flip-up door that you can put stuff in. And actually, eventually, we'll allow people to own their own vehicles. So um, it, although this defeats some of the purpose of reuse, uh, people uh, can, at least you won't park them at your house. You'll park them in a warehouse somewhere uh, so you're not occupying real estate to do parking. Um, initially, they won't be private vehicles, but eventually I can foresee that, that happening.
Mm -hmm. Would the passenger escape from the from the car if the if if a car is broken? So they they just jump from the. No, we don't. We don't let them jump out. <laughs> the the vehicle locks closed, and they have to be rescued. Basically, there's two ways to. Uh, uh, this vehicle has an onboard battery, which is small, but it, it will let the vehicle go under its own power to the closest station. Um, but if there's some physical break in the guideway where the vehicle can't move because of a obstruction, they would have to be rescued. We don't foresee a lot of that. Problems happening. I, I lived in New York City for 10 years and took the New York subway, and I sat for many an hour underneath the East River in a blacked-out subway car with no air conditioning and 90-degree heat. So it's people get used to it. But I think we'll have less of those problems because we have the backup uh, system to be, able, you know, self-propelled operation. Well, I, um, I can talk about the City of Mountain View. We've been talking to them for over a year. They're very excited about SkyTran. Um, uh, I urge you to go to any of the public meetings uh, that Mountain View has. Ma Mountain View is going through their general plan update and their precise plan update for the North Bay Share area. So they're actively looking for public comments. But they're very excited about this because they Google is growing so fast now that their North Bay Shore, Rangsdorf, and Charleston are at capacity, there, there, no more room for cars, and Google wants to double their employee base, so they need something. It's a very political question, but yeah, we could we could do that route. Um, it would cost, I think, the high speed rail budget is twenty hundred billion dollars. We could do at ten million dollars a mile. What is it? 300 miles. It would be a four billion dollar project, so a 25th of the cost. Uh, we've we've had one meeting with uh, Governor Brown's office, and they they want to see uh, our test track up and running at NASA before they consider something like that. We're we have a two year project plan right now. We've got a, a vehicle built at, over in Building 14, and we're now building a quarter mile loop uh, over by Hangar 2. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'll keep moving. How are we doing on time, by the way? Okay. So um, here's some cost numbers. Um, typical um, bullet train costs $500 million a mile. I think the high speed rail is coming in about $60 million a mile, something like that. The VTA light rail costs uh, $100 million a mile. And I've seen light rail systems as low as 50 million. That's considered a cheap light rail system. Um, freeways are about 40 million dollars per lane mile um, to add a new lane to a freeway. Sidewalks cost two million dollars a mile. So Skytrain, we're we're looking at around nine million dollars a mile with the vehicles and stations included. So you can do the math and figure out, you know, how much uh, systems cost. And the reason we can do it this cheap is because these these pieces are made in a factory. A typical rail or highway project is built on site with concrete, rebar, and hard hats. It's all custom. If you if you do something in a factory, you can lower the cost of production and make it cheap. And these stations uh, are modular and they go together like a, like a kit. So anytime you build stuff in a factory, you get low high volume uh, economies of scale. And we know this from the car industry, right? If you look at what's inside of a, a modern car, if you built one of those one at a time, it would cost you $200,000 to build a car. But because we've got these huge economies of scale, mass production, we can you can buy a car for $20,000. It's amazing. And we want to apply those same principles to, to public transit and, and these mass produce these components in high volume. All right, so that's all I had on the intro. Um, if we have time here, I'd like to go through some of the uh, intro to the software. I could also talk about Mountain View if you guys want to hear about that. To, so this is a, a Mountain View recently had a, a transportation summit. So, whoops, you can't see that, can you? 
Uh, this was a talk I gave. Uh, Mountain View invited a bunch of companies to come and speak about transit because they, the planning department is saying, well, we can't finish the general plan because we have no solution for transportation. So we presented uh, SkyTran at that uh, meeting. And this is the situation. All right, this is rush hour. This is taken from Google Maps. Uh, and there's Google right there. <laughs> So they have completely, and this is not an accident, or this is just normal morning rush hour. This, uh, this is the 85-101 free, freeway interchange. It's been rebuilt three times in the last two decades, and it still doesn't have enough capacity. And you can see the North, North Shore line is heavily congested. Um, so that's a, that represents 40,000 car trips per day. Uh, there's Google, there's Microsoft, LinkedIn, Intuit. Uh, and, and the normal traffic. So what is 40,000 trips per day? That translates to 4,000 cars per hour on those roads. Um, that's the, the current traffic situation. The projected near term uh, within the next decade is 80,000 cars per day, which translates to 8,000 cars per hour. And this is just impossible with the current infrastructure. That's what it's going to look like <laughs> if we do that. So we have two options, right? This is the, uh, sorry, the graph is a 3D, but this, um, so we're at 4,000 cars per day. Now, Google has this fantastic thing called the Google Shuttles, right? So a quarter of the trips every day are not cars, actually. They have a shuttle system that brings people from all over the Bay Area into Google. So they're, they're way ahead of the curve in terms of public transit or private transit, I guess you would call it. The problem is if Google doubles in size and all the other companies in North Bay Shore double in size, you'll have a situation where you have 6,000 car, cars per hour at rush hour, which is even if they keep their shuttle system expanding at their current rate. Uh, and basically, everyone knows that this is not possible. That the Planning Commission is saying we cannot continue business as usual. It will just it'll create a nightmare. And it also spills over into 101, too. 101 gets congested. So, so the, the goal is to get the 50% alternative transit, 50% cars. Um, so that means you've got to move, you know, 4,000 people an hour on some kind of other system other than cars. Did they discuss any kind of aggressive congestion pricing model? Um, one of the companies uh, suggested uh, charging for parking. Uh, that was the only proposal I heard. In London and others, the rate goes up when you get the congestion. Yeah, well, go to the meetings. You could propose that. I'm sure they'd be. They're looking for solutions. So these are the kind of um, options that we could do: uh, carpooling, uh, local bus, standard PRT, a light rail extension, or high-speed PRT. And I'm I'm running out of time here, so I'm not going to go through all these. Um, shuttle buses is probably the top on the list. Um, they're, they're talking about putting an extra parking lot off of 101 for, to absorb cars and then use shuttle buses. The problem is to move 4,000 people an hour, you would need a fleet of 60 bu shuttle buses running at 30 second spacing uh, at a cost of $16 million a year. Um, and I think that is going to be challenging to make that work, <laughs> just getting the buses at that high frequency. Um, so what we're talking about um, is using only 500 SkyTrain vehicles circulating, and we can carry 4,000 people an hour. And what I'm going to I'm going to skip to the the, um, the punchline here and show you. Oh, sorry, <laughs> that's not the punchline. That's the next talk a preview of the next talk. Uh, sorry. Why is this thing doing this to me? Yeah, uh, June 5th, is that's what I'll be talking about. Sorry about this. I wasn't quite ready here. So this is a Python uh, simulator, which does two things. It simulates the control system for SkyTran. It's a truly distributed control system, right? There's a computer in each vehicle. There's a computer at each merge point, so when you're when two vehicles are coming into a common point, they they request permission or a reservation slot. So you so you actually um, 
um, uh, don't have collisions. Can you see that? Yeah. So I'm going to start up the control system. So this is actually real traffic data. For Sorry? Yeah, there, there's the wind tunnel right there. Um, so Google is, NASA is giving Google permission to build a million square foot building on the NASA property. So the big fight is, you know, Google wants two bridges over the, of that creek, and the city of Mountain View is saying, no, we don't. There's too many. There's a bike path there, and the the bridges are going to impact, cause them to have to remove the bike path. Um, so there's a lot of fight against that. So city of Mountain View wants to build one bridge just for emergency vehicles, uh, and and no private cars. So what we're saying is, well, let's just put this little elevated guideway over there and circulate people around without having to build bridges. Um, so what we did is we modeled uh, you know, a rush hour. Um, actually, the, the biggest rush hour at Google is lunchtime, because they have 34 cafeterias and um, 4, 15,000 people moving between them. So the, what you see here is the circles are stations. Uh, the squares are vehicles. Uh, a white vehicle is empty. And the blue ones have people in them. And it takes a minute for it to spin up here. Um, so the, my interest in this is the algorithms, right? How do you route these vehicles in an optimal way? How do you make sure they don't collide? There's some pretty complex math to make this all work. Uh, we, we're simulating the real trajectory of the vehicles with the acceleration profiles, realistic uh, velocity profiles. So you can see there's a station. You have a series of vehicles going past at high speed without stopping. Uh, and then these are vehicles that are launching from the vehicle. Now, the, it looks like they're moving on top of each other, and that's because I didn't do the visualization to show the parallel diagonal parking. Um, so these stations are, have a parallel burst, so you can have multiple vehicles leaving and entering at the same time. And you can see as the the vehicles turn blue, that's people getting in them, and the vehicles will launch and merge at a, at a vacant space. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Our our data rates are quite a bit lower than uh, the traditional router. You know, these these vehicles are every half second, right? The packet hits the station a half second, so we don't have as much of the. Um, bandwidth issues that you have a, with the telecommunication system. But I think the routing, the interesting problems here are the routing of the empty vehicles in an optimal way, because there there's a lot of different ways you can do that um, to, to increase throughput. So I'm, I'm looking at average wait time. In this case, it's one minute uh, wait time. Uh, utilization of vehicles is at 63%. You want to uh, you don't want to have too many vehicles on the network because then they, it fills up. Um, but you also want to have enough empties that you can service everyone. Yes? Uh, I love this demo. And I, I thought the way you were setting us up was you were talking to us about the uh, shoreline exit issue, which I've, I've seen. OK. Um, but this doesn't connect anywhere past Google, right? So this yeah. doesn't really even solve that problem. Yeah, the, there, so the city of Mountain View, we have another simulation which connects down to Castro Street. And I didn't show it because it, it's so long that you can't see anything. This is a smaller compact. So we did this one first for Google, and then the Mountain View, city of Mountain View had us extend it all the way to Castro Street. And if, if you want to stay after, I can show you that one also. Um, it's just, it's a, my question then is, would just bringing a branch line down to Castro solve the problem or given the it's a multiple dimension yeah. you've got to have the district parking right so you've got to have another parking lot 
somewhere right off 101, and then you can shuttle people. You take SkyTrain from the parking lot into Google. You've got to have Caltrain. The problem with Caltrain is it's such a low capacity that it doesn't really solve much problems. So you, you need to electrify Caltrain, which will hopefully double the capacity. And then you can run a lot, you go from the Caltrain station up to Google. Uh, and then you have to have, you know, buses on El Camino, and then you have to have the, um, if, one of the problems with the Google shuttles is only 25% of the employees use it, even though it's free. And that's because the, the bus takes so long through, it's inconvenient to, to catch the bus. So the idea is to dump everyone off at a common point and then bring them directly to their building, the SkyTran. And that will hopefully increase utilization of, of the shuttle system. The other thing we can do is carpooling. If we have organized carpooling with the employees, one of the problems, one of the reasons people don't carpool is because you have to go around and pick everybody up. Or, uh, with SkyTrain, you could have them come to one point and, and meet, meet the carpool driver. So it's, it's not one solution. It's a, it's a multitude of things you have to do to, to solve this problem. And ideally, what would happen is that you would um, uh, run SkyTrain all the way to San Francisco, right? I mean, that's the goal is that we would, people would be so happy with it that you would extend it up the peninsula. Mm -hmm. Now, so would the stations be lower? Because I imagine if you're just really going across the Google campus, will people be really going to walk up two flights of stairs? It's only about eight feet. The, it's a, uh, eight foot stairs, and we have elevators also. So if you don't want to walk up the stairs, you can take the elevator. Um, but you're right. We could We could run the... The vehicle right into the second floor of a building, you know, so they could they get to go from the building into the into. Um, yeah, here's a question. Um, I understand that Aaron Pastor had kind of the same concept for Swift, and he came up with like tremendously different numbers and said it's just viable for population yeah. densities of five thousand and more. So what's the big difference between SkyTrain and, and and Swift? I looked at his analysis. It's very, I mean. I've been studying this for five years, and he looked at it for a month. I met the guy. He came and saw me, but he didn't really do an in-depth analysis. And I, and I have a, a four-page rebuttal to his, his article. If you're interested, I can give it to you. But the, 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 what he's saying is that people don't want to walk 10 minutes from their house to the station. But actually, it's, it's the exact opposite. You have a, a five or 10 minute walk from your house to the station, but then at the other end, you're close. So you, and also, you save the time circling for parking. Um, and he, he makes the argument you can't make it work in Palo Alto. Well, Palo Alto is, is very low population density because Stanford is there. If you count the Stanford population density and Palo Alto, it, the business model works. And what he's, he didn't understand is the station capacity, right? The, the, the density of population is related to how big do you make the stations. And with these high volume stations I described before, you can, you can make it work. Um, but it's, it's too complicated to show, and I can't give you an answer in one minute. And following up on that, on that question, like, how much do you think like, a, a day ticket would cost me? Well, our day goal day? is, uh, so driving costs 50 cents a mile. People think driving costs what gas costs, which is 12 cents a mile, but the total cost of driving is 50 cents. We're targeting uh, between 20 and 40 cents a mile for using SkyTrans. We want to be cheaper than driving, but with a better experience. And by the way, riding Caltrain is about, I think, 40 or 50 cents a mile. And that's, that's what you pay. Then the taxpayers kick in another double that on top, on, to pay for the whole system. Any more questions? So I'd love to dive into the algorithms on this thing and, and just come to my talk on June 5th and I'll, we'll strictly deal with the math and, and computer science algorithms uh, at, that, at that time. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, if anybody is interested in collaborating on the, you know, we're looking to bring on people to SkyTran to work on algorithm development. So uh, that's one of the reasons I'm here is to really see who's here and what they're interested in. Any other questions? He took his drink and things like that.
Sure, yeah, we can walk over. Yep. Yeah, they will. We, well, the problem is we don't have our test track yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's the goal. I've met with Anna Eshu. I mean, she knows.
I turned it off the clock. Yeah, you're yeah. Are you in building 14 as well? Yeah, I, I, I took over. Yeah, one thing. We had the money. We, 